أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Islam for the last 50 years with um, the lecture that was given before about Darwinism, whether it's scientific or not, whether it is religious or not. And in fact, I found out that um, Islam uh, in the 7th century already spoke about natural selection and in fact uh, the birth of Muhammad, the creator of Islam, is an outcome of a divine, and if you want, natural selection. In Arabic, the name of Muhammad, Muhammad has got many names, but one of the most important names is Mustafa. Mustafa in Arabic means he who was selected. And the idea is that since the time of Adam, the first human being, God selected from every generation the best of all the descendants of Adam. So there was a, some kind of natural selection, one generation after the other. Until at the end, he selected the best of the best of the best of the best. And this is the Prophet Muhammad. And he chose him to give him his word, the exact word of God, and of course selected him to be the prophet that will bring to humanity the finest of all revelations. This is Islam. So if we, usually when we speak about Islam and people speak about Islam, they use terminology which they take from their own culture, which has nothing to do with Islam. They use terms which they hear and they don't know what they are. And we know it in this country, all of a sudden a word like Hudna appears and everybody writes Hudna. But if you ask whoever writes about Hudna in the newspapers, what does it mean? He's got no idea that we are talking about a legal, legal concept. The last thing that I heard was something like Tahdiya. Now Tahdiya, and everybody started writing about Tahdiya. Of course, nobody, people that don't know proper Arabic, I'm talking about proper Arabic. And they don't understand what it means, and they don't understand that that Arab, the Arabic language being the language of God, the only language of God, all the other languages are not the divine language. This is the language which was God's, God's, um, God's um, uh, prophecy or God's um, uh, holy book was transmitted. Um, that the Arabic language is the most versatile language possible, and the Arabs are experts in using these language to finesse, which, um, uh, which only people that really live with this language understand. So um, what I want to do this evening with you is to talk about the theory of war, the theory of peace, and talk about few terms which are used by, by Muslims and by Arabic-speaking Muslims. And there are many Muslims in the world, you know, we're talking about one billion and a quarter people in the world. We're talking about a huge quantity of people that are Muslims in the world. And it's not, an easy, it's not such a simple thing to make so many people Muslims. It means that we are talking about a culture which is highly rich, highly interesting, and highly rewarding. And that's what the most important thing. It's highly rewarding because basically for the ordinary person, it's a very, very simple religion. I'm not talking about philosophers, I'm not talking about um, academicians, I'm not talking about, uh, about the great theologians, I'm talking about the simple person for whom Islam is 
the most rewarding of all religions. The end of the story, if he is a good Muslim, when he dies, he is going to go straight into paradise, and paradise is described in the most colorful way possible in the Quran. And um, this, uh, for this reason, I think we should speak about Islam with um, great respect. And not just, you know, as I can hear some people say, well, it's Islam, it's not. You know, it's not. And it's not a simple thing that a person like me and others like, and like uh, me in the academy, um, uh, in fact, uh, dedicated their life for the studying of this culture. Now, Islam is not a religion in the ordinary, simple way of thinking. Islam is a culture which comprises everything. And most of all, it is a culture based on revelation, and it is a culture which is based on a legal system. It is basically a legal system. It is a legal system which comprises everything it comprises the life of the individual, it comprises the life of the society, it comprises the state. That's one thing. Secondly, it is a world religion. It's not like Judaism, which is not a world religion. It is connected with the chosen people and it's only for them. And it's not connected with the territory of the world, it's connected with one small country. Islam is a world religion connected with the world and it is one it wants to, to it wants to establish world order for Islam the whole world is one state and all the people of the world are those people who live in this one state now when uh, Muhammad came with this idea he, the words came from God to him and it says, I don't know how many do you, any people know Arabic here? They don't. So I, I will not quote in Arabic. Um, in Surah 61, verses 11, 13, we hear that God sent Muhammad with the true religion, with the right message, with the right path, in order that it should overcome all the other religions. Which means that there is only one truth. Jews and Christians, which are called the people of the book, had once their own truth, but they were not a very good custodians. And they falsified their books. That's why Allah had to send another prophet, a modern prophet that should bring the last word of God and the only word of God to humanity. This is the Quran. Nothing can be superior to it. And because of that, this religion is regarded to be one that stands on top of everything else. In Arabic, they say, Al-Islam ya'lu wa la yu'la alayhi. Islam is superior Nothing can be superior to it. It means we are talking about not only the final word of God, not only about the finest word of God, but the truest of all revelations. Now what does the, 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 what does the community have to do? The community of the believers. Those people that were lucky enough to have their hearts open and to have accepted the call of the Prophet Muhammad. What do they have to do? They have a mission in this world to bring the word of God to the whole universe or if you want, to the whole of this planet. For this, they have got to make an effort and the effort is, the end of the effort is that we will have one state. 
going to be an Islamic state all over the world. Now at the beginning, after the death of Muhammad, people that took his place, the caliphs, sent the armies of Islam. And they were very, very successful. Similar in many ways to the creation of the Roman Empire. Within 100 years, Islam created an empire by conquering all the nations, all the territories, from the Indus to the Atlantic, and from the Indian Ocean to the center of France. In the year 732, they were stopped. And they were stopped, and from then onwards, Islam first of all stabilized itself from the Pyrenees over Spain of today, North Africa, the Middle East, to the borders of India. The rest of the job of Islam, the rest of the work of Islam, was done not through the army, but through persuasion. Through persuasion, Islam entered beyond India. Through persuasion, Islam entered beyond the Oxus and the Jaktartis, talking about the two rivers pouring into the poor Aral Sea that doesn't exist anymore almost. Now, um, how was it created? Yes, Islam was stopped, and until today, of course, it dreams about creating a world empire. It is imperial by, 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 by nature. And, but it's not imperial because um, Jack uh, and John wants to create an empire, or Muhammad and Hussein want to create an empire, because Allah wants that his word and his law is brought to the rest of the world, not remaining only in Arabia. That's the, best, the idea which was created um, concerning the development of, uh, of, the Islam, of, the, of the Islamic law in the world as such. So how is it done? The Prophet spoke about the need to fight. And the term was created for this fighting. The term was jihad. But the word jihad is not a simple word as you probably read about it in the newspaper. It doesn't mean only a holy war. The word jihad was create, comes from the Arabic word, Arabic verb jihada, which means to make an effort. And the Jewish tell us, and we are talking about the Jewish of Islam, the Jewish tell us that there are four kinds of efforts. One, they say it's in the heart. One is by the hand. And one is by the sword. The one by the hand has got two sides to it. The one by the heart is the need for the person to find the devil. That's a very great jihad. It's not so easy to find the devil. Nowadays, the apologists, the apologists of Islam today, they say, no, jihad is only to fight, to fight the devil. That's true. That's a very great jihad because you know that it's very difficult to fight the devil, to fight the evil inclinations. But, yes, but there are also other sides of jihad. There is a jihad by hand. And the jihad by hand and mouth, that's what it's called, jihad by hand and mouth. This is to support doing good and to refrain for evil, from evil, which we are talking about a moral idea. The, third, the fourth kind of jihad, this is the sword. And this is called a small jihad, very interesting. The big jihad is fighting against your inclinations and moral but the small jihad is to take the sword and to create the empire of Islam. And the sword was used. And the sword was used, as I said, until the 8th century, 
And then when the Turks came to the world of Islam in the 11th century, it continued, and it stopped finally at the 17th century at the wars of Vienna. From then on, Islam started its retreat and found itself in a situation whereby it is not anymore a victorious religion, but a religion which is now being defeated. This way or another, the Mongols or the other. But, but at the end of the story, we are still with a very, very great empire and with a dream to, con to develop this empire into, the, into a world empire. Now, one asks oneself, we are talk what we are talking, in fact, if we speak about a territory which is already occupied by Islam, what happened with the other territory which is not yet being occupied by Islam. The Islamic jurists develop, or sorry, the, the Islamic jurists uh, divide the world into two. Those parts which are already under the rule of Islam are called Dar al-Islam, the house of Islam, or the territories of Islam, or the dominion of Islam. The territories which are outside, which are not yet conquered, they are called the house of war. Now, all what I'm telling you now is based on a book which was written by a Muslim scholar called Majid Khadouri. And the name of the book is War and Peace in Islam. So no, I'm, not, I'm not, in fact, saying a word which is basically my own. I'm, in fact, repeating what this very important scholar wrote in 1955. Here and there I'll add a few verses, but basically this is what he wrote, and I, any, anybody who is interested in this type of literature uh, is invited to read this book, War and Peace in Islam, published in John Hopkins in 1955. So the world is divided. On the one hand, you have the house of Islam, where peace should be dwelling. Peace is only where Muslims are. If they fight amongst each other, and it happened a lot, then they fight amongst each other, it's a family business when they fight amongst each other. But the real enemy is that this, this, this part of the world that is called the house of war. And of course, when we speak about the house of war, we speak about people that are regarded to be infidels because they are not Muslims. And Allah says to Muhammad, when he sent him with the true religion, that he should overcome all the other religions. Now, when, when there is a war, it can have also times in which there is no war where the war ceases. And it happened quite a lot in the relations between Islam and the non-Muslim part of the world. Now, what happens also when within the Islamic territories are people who are not Muslims? What do you do with them? And the answer is very simple. Usually, Islam met either Christians or Jews. These people, although they are regarded to be in a way infidels, they are, on the other hand, people that had a revelation. That's what they are called the people of the book. And because they are the people of the book, they have got a special position under Islam. They are tolerated people. Now, usually, when people speak about tolerance, people get very excited about what a wonderful thing is tolerance. Now, tolerance is not a wonderful thing. Because tolerance is not something which you get because you've got the right to have it. But tolerance is because there is somebody who tolerates you. And he calls the rules. Therefore, 
Islam, since it is, be, it is the religion of the elite, of the rulers, it is the ruling religion, if it wants, it can tolerate, and it tolerates the Jews and the Christians. And, um, but Jews and Christians must accept the superiority of Islam and the superiority of the Islamic law. There is no way in which you can live under Islam and not accept the superiority of the Islamic law. If something happens, and Jews and Christians, or Jews or Christians, establish themselves in a territory which is not, which used to be Islamic, once used to be Islamic, like the Spanish today in Spain, this is regarded to be a reverse of history. This is something which is unacceptable. It might be only a temporary thing, but it's unacceptable because any territory which had been conquered by Islam cannot change its status as far as the Islamic law is concerned. Once an Islamic territory, always an Islamic territory. It is connected with Spain, it's connected with Sicily, and it's connected with many other places in Europe itself. Now, if the war continues all the time, the idea is that there is a holy war this holy war does not have to be only by the sword. Sometimes the sword is not needed. There is a war by the mouth. There is a war by propaganda. There is a war by bringing the, the, the message of Islam to the people which Islam regards them to be, those who live in the house of war. And once this idea is brought, the idea is adapted, that uh, in fact Islam can be, can be spread not only by the sword, but also by the word of the mouth and propaganda. This has been done in few places throughout the world, and it's being done today also. <coughs> now, the question is, we have a situation, which is the normal situation, is Majat Kaduri right? The normal situation is that there is a permanent war, that's the permanent relations, the permanent war between the house of Islam and the house of war. That's the real situation. War. Usually by the sword. But what happens if Islam finds itself in a situation whereby it cannot fight. There is a reason for it, it cannot fight. The most important reason is that the enemy is too strong. It happened in Islamic history many times. I'll give you one example which everybody knows, the Crusades, the Crusaders. For a long, for very, very long, long periods, Islam found itself in a situation where it could not fight the enemy. Now it accepted its existence, not the jury, did exist accept the existence of the crusaders as something which has got a, they have got a right to be in a territory which is regarded to be an Islamic territory. But they accepted them as de facto. I remember very well when uh, President Sadat came to this country and um, I remember it because at that time I was connected with this business. And he said in famous speech of his, we did not accept your existence, now we do. And everybody was very excited about it. And the answer is they should not be excited because the idea is that you don't fight something, something which is only only in your imagination. If Israel is an imaginary thing, you don't accept it as a, as a fact. So you are fighting something imaginary. And therefore, the Islam accepted the fact that there were crusaders in this country. And for a very long period, 
it kept peaceful relations with them. So what happens? If you keep peaceful relations with the enemy, it means you stop the jihad. But the jihad is incumbent on you. It's incumbent on the, on the Islamic community as such, not only on every individual. On the Islamic community as such, it is incumbent on the community to fight against the infidel, to fight for the creation of the Islamic Empire, for the creation of the Islamic State, to bring, to bring the law of God to these territories. The idea is not to bring the law of God to the individuals. It's not Christianity with personal salvation. Also world religion, but there is personal salvation. Here we are talking about a territorial attitude, which means the whole territory of the world has to become Muslim and to be and to succumb or to be under the rule of the Islamic law. So what happens if you cannot do it? Usually because the other side is too strong. The Islamic jurists tell us that in such a case, you are allowed to go to create an armistice. Armistice. Pay attention, the word is, the word which is usually used in Arabic is salam. Now salam is not an armistice, it's a condition, it's a situation. It's not a legal concept, pay attention. Salam, peace, the way we translate peace into Arabic, this is not a legal concept, it is a situation. It's a situation in which there is no war. But the legal concept, and that's what we are interested all the time because Islam is a legal system. The legal concept is hudna. Hudna in Arabic means ceasefire, cessation of war. There is no, no fighting in the time of the Hudna. It is based on uh, some sort of, uh, of um, historical event connected with the life of Muhammad. This was the precedent. Doesn't make any difference at this moment. But what's important is that in the case of Hudna, we are talking about a legal system, a legal, a legal concept. Is Hudna a peace forever? The answer, it is not. Because it is impossible to stop jihad forever. And when I talk about forever, I'm talking about for a long, very long period. Hudna is connected with a very limited period that must be put into the text of the Hudna itself, whether this text is written or whether this text is not written. And the text of the Hudna demands that the maximum time of the <coughs> treaty, in this case the treaty of the armistice, is 10 years. Sometimes it goes to 10 years, 5 months, 40 days, and something like that. It can be also elongated over another 10 years, another 50 years, five years. But remember, you cannot stop the war for the expansion of Islam forever. Now, what happens in modern times? In modern times, we find at least two peace agreements in this country, which I'm not so much interested in them, but since we are talking about it, two peace agreements which basically are not according to the laws of Islam. They are peace agreements which are done according to the laws of nations. It is done, these peace agreements are done because some sort of other considerations came in, but they are not Islamic. This is one of the weaknesses of these agreements. Because if they are not Islamic, you can hear it even today, that everybody who is lover of Islam, a Muslim, a theologian, a jurist in Islam, would say to you these are illegal, illegal agreements. 
That's why they are very precarious. They will be very precarious in the future also. <coughs> but let's go back to what we were saying before, and this is the, this is the agreement of the Hudna. That's the only, only legal possibility to stop the jihad. There's no other possibility and no other, no other way of creating a situation where the jihad can be stopped. Always to 10 years or less. However, there is one problem with the idea of the Hutna. What happens if Islam becomes very strong and can renew the jihad? <coughs> the answer is that the Hudna at that very moment stopped to be followed. It stopped to, to hold as an agreement. Because in this case, there is no reason whatsoever to stop the holy war, which of course aimed to bring, as I said, the word of God to the world. Now, in a nutshell, I try to bring you the idea of war and peace in Islam. Let me just sum it up for you for one second if you do pay attention. One, Islam is, Islam is um, a religion that wants to create a world empire. It's not an idea of an, an, an imperial idea, but it is part of the religion itself. The world empire is territorial. Remember territory, not people. People are not, are, there's not a question of Islamizing the people in these territories. Because Islamization, if a person accepts Islam, it is because God opened his heart to, to, to accept Islam, not because somebody convinced him, or, although to convince people to accept Islam is a very important thing. It's part of some kind of jihad. And this wish to create an Islamic empire can never be stopped except in one condition when Islam finds itself in a situation whereby it cannot continue the war. Then he can, can revert to one thing, to armistice, to cease fire, and nothing more. There is no possibility whatsoever to create a situation whereby Hudna can stop forever. Thank you. Well, but what happened with Saladin, he went into jihad, he also called it, like others at that time, jihad. He succeeded in beating, beating the Crusaders in Hittin. This was 1187. Crusaders remained in this country for another 100, 103 years. And um, that, was, that was with him. But, uh, he came into agreement with Richard Lionheart in 1192 near Jaffa, which was uh, the first hudna that he could do at the time. And they were the second, the second very interesting hudna for another 10 years was in, in 1229 between uh, Al Malik and Kamil of Egypt and uh, Friedrich II, the uh, Kaiser, the Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, in which. Uh, that uh, there was a situation in which uh, the Muslim find himself that they have to succumb to the wishes of the em of the emperor and even deliver to him Jerusalem. So there was always a the, the, the minute Islam finds itself in a position of weakness, it never went with its head to the wall. Never. It's always always accepted the situation as it is and find 
the legal reasons were were war and this war. <coughs> I always say there is there is one mistake in negotiating in the Middle East, um, and uh, there is the problem is they come and ask you, say, have you got a solution? And you say, well, that I'm talking about negotiating between between the Arabs and let's say Israel, or it can be any other. Say, have you got a solution? Have you got a have you got a plan? And you are you want very much peace and you want you want peace and quiet. So, no, not us. I mean I'm talking about and um, and, and whatever. So we, everybody wants peace and nobody wants to go and kill himself. So you said, Yes, I've got a I've got a plan. My plan is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I've been in this game myself. I know what I'm talking about. So the Arab says, Okay, the answer is no. Come with a better plan. Now the, the, in the Middle East you should never ask the question what is the solution? should ask the question is, you come to your opponent and say, what is your solution? You. Never write a letter in which you say, this is my plan. Because in this case, you're only starting, first of all, you demand the other side to say no. If you paid attention, it was only a few weeks ago, President Netanyahu wrote a letter to, uh, uh, to our neighbor here, the, well, I would call him uh, Mahmoud Abbas. Why should I call him Abbas? Mahmoud Abbas. Or Mr. Mahmoud Abbas. Ever. And he wrote to him a letter in which he offered few things. So she said, Mahmoud Abbas said, thank you very much, I'm taking, but the answer is no. So first of all, I take. And then he says, no. He said, can we better letter? So that's the worst mistake you can do. In the Middle East, you never, ever, Ask the question: What is my, what is the solution? And give your solution. Doesn't doesn't work like this. I I call it the laws of the of the bazaar. And I again I didn't learn it from somebody else. I learned it from, from Mr. Sadat himself. I had an opportunity to have a chat with him, and he said, "Tell your prime minister." I'm talking about 1977. He said, "Tell your prime minister this is a bazaar." The the merchandise is a little bit more expensive. Now, the idea he wanted to have a negotiation of a bazaar, it's a completely different story. In a bazaar, you never, ever present your, your case first. You present your case in the bazaar, you lose. So, every time they come and ask if the state, the government of Israel, have you got a plan? So, have you got a plan? Of course, it is the plan. Okay, have you got a plan? The answer is no. Immediately, the answer is no. Because this is what you do in the bazaar. Answer is no, they come with a better offer. And that's what I So if you ask the question what the solution, the answer is, I want to ask the other side what the solution and the other side says cannot. It's a situation where it cannot, there is no way it can offer you a solution. Because the establishment of the state of Israel, like Spain, is a reverse of history. Something which will never, ever be accepted. No matter what you do, you can, you can say, okay, I'm ready to have only the state of Tel Aviv. Even then, it's impossible. This country, like the other parts of the Islamic Empire, and I explained it before, were part of Dar al-Islam. They cannot revert to anything else. There is no way in the world you can come with the best ideas. You can pay any money you want. You can do anything that comes to your mind that you think I want to be so nice and we are trying to be as nice as possible doesn't make any difference you can be nice as one thing but there is a law of Islam which says any Islamic territory cannot stop being an Islamic territory the establishment of the state of Israel is to create two things which are wrong according to the lecture which I just gave you one Jews are ruling over Muslims it's against Islam is superior, nothing can be superior to it. Because it goes to such an extent that a Muslim can, ban, can marry a non-Muslim woman, but a Jewish cannot bear, marry a, a Muslim woman because he would be at that point physically on top. Physically on top, not only superior to her. 
So this is impossible. That's why you hear there are many Jewish girls marrying Muslims, but not the other way around. If, some, if it happens that somewhere in Europe or in America, one, one person who is Jewish married a Muslim, this is something totally unusual, totally unusual and unacceptable. The other side is definitely accepted. That's, that's very important to remember. So the Jews are ruling over Muslims, and the Jews are, that are Vimis, that can accept only a situation, can be only in a situation of, of tolerated people, are ruling in a territory which is basically Islamic. Now this is, for a Muslim, this is something which is mind-boggling, impossible. So if anybody dreams that tomorrow morning all these wonderful things, great things which are part of the civilization, the heart of the religion, are going to be changed, because six million Jews want to create for themselves a Jewish home in an Islamic territory, he is dreaming. And, and the, the minute, if, 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 if we wake up in this country and Europe wakes up, before Europe itself would be conquered by Islam, because Europe is being now conquered by Islam, not by the soul, but as Gaddafi said, and Gaddafi was not such a stupid fellow, as Gaddafi said, we don't need the soul. We only need the legal system of the Europeans and we need their democracy. No. No, if we have any chance, yes, but we don't have any chance to do what you think tomorrow morning to go to Damascus and eat hummus. This you cannot have. You can maybe eat hummus in Damascus and pay for it quite dearly and at the end of the story open the road for your destruction in the future. But if we live to, if we live this life and we understand the situation in which we are and we understand that we are talking about a great civilization, remember, great civilization, not a small thing, unbelievably great civilization which, which left us with, tremendous, with a tremendous heritage. For one second, I wouldn't give my life to study something which I think is not important. It's highly important, but remember one thing, that this great religion and this great civilization has got its own rules. And we are too small in the eyes of Islam. The rest of the world is too small. We are even nothing in the eyes of Islam to come and have demands in an Islamic territory, into Islamic history, and with the Islamic past. It is impossible. And the only thing, the only reason, one second, just want to say this thing. The only way in which you can have hudna is that Islam will decide that you are too strong to fight. That's the only way. The only way. If Islam in the one moment feels that you are, you are weak, then you are not giving Islam the alibi to stop the uh, stop jihad. Islam needs an alibi to stop jihad. And the alibi is the crusaders are too strong. Okay, thank you.